Yeah. Sometimes animals are smarter than we give them credit for. Uh, you may be right. Richard Grace. I bet you Richard Grace has some uh, warblers in his yard. Peck is on with us and Martin Eastburn and Mike Wiesner. Still cloudy in Arizona. I thought it was always sunny in Arizona. It does have a lot of sunny days. That's true. Isn't there a song that doesn't rain in Southern Arizona? No, Southern California. California. That was a joke. Oh. Bad one, but I guess a dad joke. It was a metaphor for something. I'm not sure what it was. I think it was a, it was a yeah, dad, one thing dad joke. Cal one thing they had in Southern California is freaking oil spills. Oh, yeah, that. Not like they used to, though. How about 156,000 barrels? Uh, was Is it barrels or gallons? Yeah. Either way, it's a lot of oil. I don't know. I just you know, know a long time ago. You remember the Exxon Valdez? Oil oh yeah, spill? Oh, yeah. Uh, the Valdez actually got uh, put to port in San Diego. I remember seeing it out there. You know, wow. it was like I don't know. It's strange to see it. Like it was almost unreal. You know, somehow. Yeah, it's just overly sad, man. It's just really sad. Yeah, but, you know, the good thing is, the good thing is, is that I think they're being more careful with these things, so. Oh, the technology, the, te the cleanup technology is vast also. I mean, it's. Yeah, it's right. Yeah. yeah. And we learned how to do it, you know. Unfortunately, it, it takes something catastrophic to happen but humans are pretty clever yeah 23, yeah 23 hours ago they posted a story that said it was a tear in a pipeline that's what they're blaming now hmm. it's 144,000 gallons okay we got gallons all right that's okay 144,000 42 that's 
3,400 and change oil. barrels of oil. This is one that is pretty common in Natural Bridge area, Red River Gorge area. You can find them on the Kentucky River, different places throughout the state. We have a credible diversity of neotropical migrant songbirds in the state of Kentucky. He's just one of dozens of species. Warblers are, are just pretty good indicators of uh, the health of your forest. A lot of these birds really need intact, large tracts of forested areas to survive. Um, they're not necessarily what we would consider endangered, but many of them are declining species. So they're not doing that great, and it's mainly because of habitat loss. A huge number of our breeding warblers uh, use natural bridge in the Red River Gorge area. And they, of course, are, are almost the definition of neotropical migrants. Many of them breed here in the summer and they'll fly to all the way to Columbia in some cases and back every year. So Jeez. habitat loss at both ends is affecting their population. Well, hello everybody. This is Scott Roberts here with Kent Marsh and Dan George. And uh, this week we're gonna be talking about warblers and uh, a little intro into binoculars um, for those of you that like to look at, uh, you know, birds. And so, um, Kent, uh, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Uh, I learned, I mean, I did learn today that uh, warblers are in every state of the United States. Um, probably all over Mexico, and, and uh, uh, it's considered a common bird, but um, what more can you tell us? Uh, they're spectacular songbirds. They, as, as Dennis talked about, they have some of the most beautiful and, and melodious songs out there. Uh, there's a huge number of them, um, and they're in the, the passerine family, which basically start out being sparrows and uh, they're perching birds, and it's cool to have a tow arrangement that allows them to perch very well. Uh, hmm. It's Dan, is it three on the front and one in the back, or one on the front and three in the back? I can't remember. I'm doing this off the top of my head. You mean as far as their claws? Yes, sir. Three in the front and one in the back. Right, which allows them, which is one of the uh, the the markers for a passerine. Uh, which it also allows was, them as they as they as they pull in their 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 grip basically will just grip onto a onto a, a, a twig. It's a great gripping source for them to be able to you know just be horizontal on a tree. Yeah, to to just perch there. So anyway, let's get into it. These are some beautiful birds. I have a question uh, though. I have a question. Okay. Remember in the video they were showing they were holding onto that warbler like you know in his finger. How in the heck do you get a bird to? Do you net them? I mean, how yeah, do, yeah you catch them, catch them either in a, a bird trap of some sort, like a, like a, one of the guys here has built a uh, house sparrow trap. Uh, okay. Has not managed to catch one yet, or uh, like they do bird surveys, they hang these mist nets. They're very fine, invisible nets. They're loose, and the bird flies into it, and then they just go untangle it and. Oh. I so a lot of time, and a lot of times they'll they'll tag them too, so right. that, band them of some sort, so that so that they can, if it gets caught again, they can say, "Oh, this bird was banded on this day and this location," and, and have some some data about that specific bird. Right. Yeah, and so yeah. It, it watching Scott, I noticed watching them. We've seen, you've shown videos three or four times now of people holding birds. And they always hold them in the same exact way. So that must be a, you know, I would tend to think the of holding official a bird. bird handling grip, right? Yeah, the official, exactly. As opposed to just holding them by their bodies and wings. I mean, clearly that bird's not freaking out, flapping and trying to get away. So it must be a, sure. a position of calming nature or something, because uh, that's the way we've seen a number of people hold birds. Dan, any insight to that? Yeah, in fact, uh, you have to be certified to to net and catch wild birds. So, and, and there's a technique, and of course, they grab them basically by the feet, and then they're able to get to put the the, the band on one of the one of the legs. They're so small, mm -hmm. they're so small that once they fly away, I mean, they, they're never they're never hurt to the point of 
you know, have to put them down type thing. And it's done usually every springtime at the, uh, the height of migration. That's when they do it, usually. You know, I had been out with uh, some game and fish guys years ago and monitoring the health of the big lake nearby Beaver Lake. And they always put the same net, the, the same length and kind of nets out in the same location year after year. So they can try and gain a uh, understanding of uh, the fish populations in that spot over time. I suspect that same technique is, is used in the, the birding world. Uh, they don't just randomly put out nets. They go to the same spot to monitor what's going on right there over time and have something to compare it to as well. So, Dan, have you ever been out netting birds or on a netting adventure with biologists? Yeah. Yes, I have been. And it's, it's kind of amazing when you consider that the average warbler is only four and a half inches long. I mean, <laughs> it's a little it's guy. Amazing. Yeah. So we, we, one of the birds that we have, the first one, the yellow rump warbler that, that Kent will get into, it's only five and a half inches long. That's considered a large one. <laughs> so let's just, let's just use that as a segue and let's go into... And I will remember to turn on share sound. Yes, there we go. So are we sharing? You're starting to. It's there we go. Yep, yep, there it is. But you're in uh, uh, I'm in the wrong screen. Dad gum technology. Dag nabbit. Dag nabbit. Dad gum. Dad burn. Dad, Dad burn. burn. There we go. All right, that's 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 more better to coin a phrase. All right, so uh, I've got to get some have somebody cut us some entry music here for this, so it's not just uh, silence of the birds. So There's a lot of fans out there that like to hear you talk, though, Kent. Yeah, I, I, that's that's painful to me to think about. <laughs> So this is the yellow rumped warbler. Here we go. It's a sweet little song. It's it's the loud one. There. Mm -hmm. The word would be the ubiquitous. The uh, yellow rump warbler is every state in uh, in the North, North American continent. So it's a pretty sound. It's a pretty bird. Yeah. And as and we go through as we go through Kent's presentation today, folks, uh, you're gonna we're gonna go through. Uh, to we're going to go through five warblers, and when you listen to their calls, you're going to notice that they're all very distinctly different. Hmm. Well, consider the fact that there's over 45 warbler species in North America, and every one has a unique sound. So, if you are a birder and you're and you're going to a place where a particular warbler is known to be, once you learn the call, all you got to do is follow that call, and you're going to you're going to basically you're going to find them. Check that bird off as as a life life sighted bird. You know it's awesome. So, so this one is everywhere. So I looked at this bird and tried to convince myself that this picture is not a yellow rump warbler, because uh, a lot of times they have a much more prominent uh, white eye line that goes across their crown, and the next bird that we have. Uh, shows it a little bit better, that white line right there. So, um, you know, I still think it is, but they look like a different bird. So I was questioning myself, or, or in this case, Terry, uh, about is this the same bird or same species? I'm going to go with I think it is. Dan, what do you think? Well, go to the first, go to the first slide again. All right. The, uh, what you see there is the rump, the rump, which is right at the base of the, yeah, that's, thank you. That's called the yellow. That's called a yellow rumped warbler. You can also see that it's got two white wing bars. And then you go to the eye, it's actually a partial white, uh, it's, a, it's a partial eye ring. 
So it's not a full one. And the interesting thing about this picture, Kent, and I would agree with you, it's not a very good photo for a diagnostic discussion about a yellow rump warbler because there are two subspecies of this, of this bird. Once the most pop, popular one is called a myrtle and the myrtle, um, the myrtle has a white throat. You can't even see the throat on this. Right. And then the Audubon's warbler, which is a different, this is another species, has, has a yellow throat and you can't see the yellow throat either. So this is, I'm glad this is coming up because bird watching as a hobby is, is, is for people that are technically oriented to look at the subtle little differences. You can see the partial yeah. white eye. And then the white throat on that one. Makes it a myrtle. Makes it a myrtle. And the yellow wash at, at the base of the primary wing being yellow, that's another, that's another uh, field mark. But if you were to go to, to the rump that you can't see on here, and it's called a yellow rump warbler, right. the, the, rump, the rump would be yellow. Right. So pretty, I'm pretty certain this is a yellow rump warbler, a myrtle, as I'm you said. I am convinced that it is. The other one is just not a really, I don't know. It's got the yellow rump. It's got the two wing bars, and it's got a partial eye ring. So I'd have to say it's a yellow rump warbler. Right. But the, true proof, by the true proof, by the way, is if you have – uh, like a, an app on your phone that you're listening to the actual call of the yellow rump warbler, you can identify them by the sound. So you can say, it doesn't matter what it looks like. That's a yellow rump warbler. And, and you used the term ubiquitous a few minutes ago. Yeah. There's the u ubiquitous red winged blackbird back there in the background too. <laughs> yeah. I keep noticing that on nearly every sound, there's a red winged blackbird hiding back there in the sound somewhere. That's right. So Love that bird. Looking at the breeding map, it's pretty, you know, all across the, the boreal forest of, forest of Canada, but um, even down into the Rocky Mountains and as far south as Arizona, there's some breeding population, or New Mexico, and even into Arizona, breeding populations, which uh, I found, and even some down in Mexico, I found that pretty odd. That's a pretty diverse and weirdly shaped breeding population map. But as we've talked about before, these maps are pretty maybe it's, not it's a representation and since birds do not have uh borders right they can go wherever they want to go but they're going to go where the food is and where the temperature is right yeah. and where they have protection and usually where there's water and food yeah all right so moving on so we're going that's to go a great, that, that last picture that's a really good picture right there you take a look at the white throat that is diagnostic right there of a yellow of a yellow rumped warbler. It's the myrtle. Right. Well, I meant to look up what myrtle, why it's a myrtle. I mean, I think of crepe myrtle as, a, you know, another word that uses myrtle. But I was curious about what the myrtle means in context of a bird. We'll never know. It maybe it was yeah. named after some of those guys' wife's name, Myrtle. That's... It's spelled M-Y-R-T-L-E. <laughs> yeah. And it's just true. Like, just, true. Just, just Myrtle. Just like just like the uh um uh crepe myrtle plants for the same way. All right, Wilson's warbler. This is a, a, a fantastically cool looking bird. Let's listen to it real quick. Okay. Hear that sound? Yeah. We have we have a question here that I'll ask. Her. Yeah, when you hear that, it's kind of an it's kind of an ascending, but it's really a bright, yeah, diagnostic it, sound of a Wilson warbler. It goes up at the end. Slightly. And speeds yeah. up. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, Scott, do you want to ask your, is it your question? Uh, yeah, this is a question timely? from Mike, Mike Wiesner to Dan George. Um, he comments first. He says he's never seen any warbler here in Arizona at elevation 4,350 feet. Maps don't show elevation. Um but for Deanne, some birds may not like being at high elevation. Is there any documentation about that? 
Uh, there, there's other field guides that would give you the details that most birders don't really care about, quite frankly. Um, not so much with warblers. Warblers pretty much are, uh, you know, I mean, I live in Colorado and they're all, there's all kinds of warblers. I'm at 5,000 or 6,000 feet. But when you go above 8,000 feet or 9,000, there might be only four or five different species that will actually go that high. Mm. But um, to, to bring the, a real answer to your question, elevation is not a factor with warblers. It really isn't. You just have to know that when you, like for example, if, there, if there, there's a couple of birds, warblers in Colorado, you, that you have to go to six, seven, 8,000 feet even to see them because they are known to be at a higher elevation. But by and large, the vast majority of your warblers are gonna be sea level, sea level up to maybe six, 7,000 feet. I'll, I'll bet in the case of Mike's location, it has more to do with food availability or something because they like certain kinds of insects, I think. Yeah, and uh, since Mr. Wiesner down there in, 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 um, in Arizona, if the more that he learns about bird, bird watching and bird watchers, if you go to Tucson and places around there, there's probably more species of warblers in south, southeastern Arizona than any place in North America. Hmm. It, is a, it is the greatest spot for birding. Just go to Madera Canyon sometime, like in May. It's unbelievable. Anyway, let's get back to this, this Wilson's right here. This is one of the typical birds. Once you, once you see a flitting little uh, yellow bird like this and it moves its head and you see that black cap, you don't need to know anything else about the Wilson's other than that's a Wilson's. It's the only, out of 45 or 50 warblers in North America, it's the only one that has a solid black cap. And it's a tiny bird. It's not big at all, right? Yes, it's only uh, it's four and three quarter inches long. Whether it be male or female doesn't matter. They're the same same length. I meant and, to ask: um, Are most warblers monomorphic? No, they're not monomorphic. Correct? No, no. In fact, I'm glad you asked that. It's just the opposite. The males are hundred percent the most colorful. They're the ones that sing. The most wonderful ones that have. Uh, identifying field marks are with the male. With the female, in the case of this particular one, the, fe this, the, uh, the, the actual uh, field marks of the Wilsons is olive above, olive colored, yellow below, with a prominent black cap. The female is just the same as the male, except it lacks the black cap and the yellow is more faint. But so, it's the case. It's the case with robins, the one that's really richly reddish, brownish chest, are always the male. The ones that washed out is the female. Okay, and this is a really good picture where you can see the toes pretty well, and see there's one toe hooked from the back, and then there's three, one prominent one, and two lesser toes. Uh, on the front, showing the the distinct perching ability of these birds. Yeah. Okay. And they, of course, they weigh nothing, you know. Yeah, they're all feathers. They're yeah. all either. Their their bones are hollow. They're all their feathers are all air basically, and you know the the the. Not that I would want to pluck one of these, but I can imagine there literally is not very much there once you get the feathers off of them, tiny little bodies. I can also share that the Wilson's warbler is one of the most popular birds along with, by the way, along with the yellow rumped warblers. Those are two that you're probably always going to see in the month of May, June, uh, where you are. Very common. Be because of migration, right? Well, it's because, no, they're just, they're ubiquitous. I mean, they're, oh, they, they're everywhere. They're mm -hmm. everywhere. You know, and, they, and the coloration is just spectacular, but we're going to get to another one here that is uh, uh, slightly more colorful. Now, not this one. This is a Tennessee warbler. And um, I'm not convinced that's what it is. Dan, you want to weigh in on it? I did. I looked yeah, and looked. And I would say that uh, 
and I'm not being critical, I'm just as a birder of 35 years, I'm saying I probably never use a Tennessee warbler as a, as a, as a, as a, an, an idea of studying warblers because they're, they're drab, they're unimpressive, they have, they have a short tail, they have a long straight bill, it's, it's green above with, gr with a gray crown and uh, a bold white eyebrow. And that's about it. So when you see this, you see kind of a faint, a faint warbler. And, it, and once it makes its call and can't, I know you have, I think you probably have the sound. Yep. yep. Once you hear the sound, you say, oh, there's a Tennessee warbler here. But, but as, as we've learned in doing this show, the visual identification is driven home by the sound. It's, uh, let, me it's, put, let me put it to you this way. The identification is confirmed by its sound. Okay. Confirmed. Right. All right. Confirmed. Right. So here we go. Let's listen. Nice. Now, if you look, if you had a picture of the male that's singing, because the females don't sing, if you had a picture of both of them, they would appear to be monomorphic. In other words, where you can't discern the difference between its, its uh, sex. See, looking at that bird right there, I'm pretty well going to go with, yeah, it's a Tennessee warbler. You, you may not be able to see it well on your screen, but... It looks really similar to the picture that Terry got. So, you know, without a sound, but. Yeah. Well, but what you, what you really see more than anything else is the white eyebrow. The right. white eyebrow is diagnostic. And I'll say that there's another 30, Warblers that are, oh my God, more impressive than the Tennessee. You mean, you mean one like this? Yes. <laughs> uh, that's pretty impressive. Yes. Yeah. Let me. You, you ought to. You ought to go to the habitat where you'd find the prothonotary warbler, and it's almost a religious experience. It's such an awesome bird. It is. It's golden yellow, with a black eye, black wings. And they're almost always in swamp areas where, you know, where, where there's water or some run, running stream because they, they, that's, where they, that's where their nests are. And so, that absolutely, look at under the tail is white. I mean, it's just an absolutely it's beautiful creation. Yeah, it's really right. pretty. Yeah. And that black bill and the black wings oh, makes the orange even brighter and make the white whiter. I think I was a bird. I think I was a birder for ten years before I ever went to a place where I could see a prothonotary. And when I got it, it was like exciting to see a yeah. prothonotary. All right, here we go. Let's listen to this beauty sing. Those other introductory sounds are, are referred to as chip notes or call notes. A lot of your warblers will have a little chip note as an introduction, and then all of a sudden that beautiful call comes out. I mean, it's just amazing. So anyway, this is just a stunningly Beautiful bird. Yeah, um, I'm glad you. you I'm glad you picked this one. You scored on this one, buddy. Uh, you know, Terry scored. I'm just the provider of Terry Stanfield's work. Um, so it's an Eastern United States bird. Yeah, but you uh, could have picked a male, a uh, house sparrow, <laughs> and then you would have turned me off. You know what I'm gonna do? When's yeah. your birthday, Dan? When's your birthday? May fifteenth. But if you send me one of those suckers, I'm gonna. <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna send you a plush toy house sparrow if i can no. find one 
for Jeez. your birthday just because it'll make you so stinking happy. Well, right. When you take a look at a prothronotary warbler and compare that to almost anything, give me a break. Yeah. You know, Baltimore Orioles up there. Oh, geez. So, I'll take but, that any day. But this is wings and beaks above, you know, a Baltimore Oriole. I mean, it's just. Why? Why? Well, well, no, you got to be that, careful. You're that talking sheer, to That sheer color is just unique. Let's put you it know. this way. What we need to do, we, we need to have a show where we were, we'll we just have an hour of just Sheldon Ferwarski's pictures of, yeah. of male birds. And I will yeah. tell you right now that the male Baltimore Oriole puts the prothonotary to shame. Uh, you know, I guess I see Baltimore Orioles and I don't see prothonotary warblers. And maybe that's why I think it's prettier because it's it's not you, common. You don't see it as often, therefore no. it's so it makes it's it just, more unique. It's like if you have two children and one is kind of a blonde, the other one's kind of a reddish hair. Which one is going to be more beautiful? Well, you have no clue, man. They're both yours, right? Exactly. All right. Yep. So how about a redhead wood what how about a redheaded woodpecker would be another one you'd want to put on that show with Sheldon? Oh yeah, and he's got some of those too. We've I've seen already some talked. Early. I've already talked to him about doing this on on one of these shows. On, but but next spring, got to do it during springtime during migration. Okay. Uh, so moving along. Um, by the way, look at the limited field uh, range for the yeah, very east south. You know the southeastern quarter of the United States. Yeah, very and limited they, range, and they are they're not. not Arkansas, though. They're not ubiquitous. You got to go to swampy areas and where there's water and yeah, that kind of yeah. thing. Which is, you know, I'm going to venture to guess that, you know, obviously this is a rainy day so you, or really super dewy day because there's drops everywhere. Uh, but he was probably shot this at the Eagle Watch Nature Area, which is adjacent to a, um, a power plant lake. Yeah. So moving along. Here is another pretty little bird, the black-throated green warbler. So let's listen to this beauty. Now, I have to note that the picture is of a female. It doesn't have that uh, black throat that the field mark for the male. Uh, uh, that's correct. That is correct. But it, um, if, if I look at notes that I've made here about this particular bird, um, the male has a black throat and two white wing bars, is bright olive above, yellow face with a greenish eye patch. Okay. <clears throat> And so the female looks almost the same, but lacks the black throat. So yep. this, is, this is, in fact, a female. You know, uh, when I looked at it, I went, oh, that's not got a black throat. And I realized female. Right? I'll tell you how marvelous birding actually is. There's uh, actually three. There's a black, there's a black throated green, which this is. Then there's a black throated gray. And then there's a black throat of blue, and they are all incredibly beautiful. Unbelievable. And, and now warblers are your favorite group of birds. Did you say that? I would say it's the most varied because there's like 45 or 50 of them in North America. I mean, that's that's the that's the widest. Uh, I think that's the the largest family of birds in North America. All right. So how big is this bird? We didn't talk. I mean, again. It's not big. None of these birds are big. This one, this is actually five inches long. Uh, however, the prothonotary is, let's say, the prothonotary is five and three quarters of inches. That's five and three quarter inches. So pretty big when it comes to warblers. Bigger by a half an inch. <laughs> yeah. But, or, like you can measure, the, like you can measure that at, at, at 25 yards. Right. Uh, you know, so. Moving on. So, all right. So, um, we're going to wrap up this segment with our 
pretty flyer of the day, which is a right. red admiral moth. Um, and I think I started to think that it was on a passion flower, but that is not a passion flower because a passion flower is a vining plant, and that very clearly is not a vining plant. So um, ended up with a different kind of flyer. I love the detail in the antenna. Look at that black, white, black, white. Look like little diamonds strung out on a oh, on yeah. a black. It was beautiful. Black, you know, velvet or something. Just, just amazing. All right. You so know, I, I could add something here that I'm not going to say the majority, but I'd say uh, the people that are bird watchers that are like totally analytical and just real scientific. When they get to a point where they've pretty much seen all that they can see, they'll go to uh, to uh, uh, they'll go to butterflies. Yeah. There's a lot, a lot of butterfly uh, hunters out there, and and the, the thing about them, the butterflies don't move much. That's why they all carry nets. So they they bring them in the net, they look, take a look at them, they photograph them, and they let them go. So, which you don't need a license to do, by the way. That is, you're correct about that. Right. So. Moving along, because now this is not the end of the end. This is the beginning of the end, I guess. Uh, we're going to talk about buying binoculars. And if anybody's ever looked at binoculars, and you always see numbers. 7 by 35, 8.5 8 by 26, 8 by 42, 10 by 50. The first step in understanding binoculars is understanding these numbers. What in the heck do all those numbers mean? And so we're going to tell you. The first number is the magnification power. So if uh, your eyeball, uh, Ed Gunther's Mark I eyeball, um, is zero power, so it's magnified seven times if you're looking at a seven by 35. The second number is the diameter of the objective lens in millimeters. And so what you learn is, make that quit ringing, so the things to remember are the larger the diameter of the objective lens, the more light is gathered and squished down and go into your eye. And if the magnification is the same, then the image will appear brighter. So if you have an a, a eight by 42 and then an eight by 50, then the eight by 50 is gonna appear, appear to be brighter because you get a bigger round circle that squishes down the light into your eye. And binoculars are just like telescopes. They effectively, other than having magnification, make the diameter of your pupil the diameter of the telescope. So imagine if like an owl, an owl's pupils get real big. Same with yours, your pupils get so big. But now if you can make your pupils seven by 35, suddenly, you're getting a whole lot more light into your eye and you can see better and see more detail because of the magnification. Uh, Dan, anything you want to weigh in on there? Yeah, so the first number <coughs> indicates, it's of course, as, as Kent said, it's the power of the eyepiece lens. And what that, what that means is the, the fact that what you are looking at is something that will appear to be seven times closer to you than the human eye. So it's not seven times bigger. It's actually, it makes the image look like it's seven times closer to you because you're looking through seven power. And then the 35, as Kent said, is the size of the outside lens, the objective lens. And that enables you to get more light into your eye to give you a brighter image. You can actually measure the little the amount of light coming into your eye by dividing the 35 by the 7. So 7 to the 35 is 5. So that means the, the mil, in millimeters, the little exit pupil, it's called, is, is five, 5 millimeters. Uh, wait a minute. The seven that's right. Yeah. 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 You're right. That's, that's what it is. I, I didn't get into the higher math, but that number can be important because if you know the diameter of your pupil, then that gives you an idea of how one, it's gonna be the bigger that, that number, the easier it's gonna to be to find and get into your eye. And number two, if you're, you know, your pupil is a certain size and all that light's going into your eye, it's going to also make it appear to be brighter. 
So um, also I'll add one thing. One reason why seven or eight power is the most popular is because the human body can actually handle seven or eight, seven power without any tremor, without any of your hands, because your, your heart's beating. So believe it or not, if you try to stand still, looking through a telescope, for example, you're not gonna be able to, <laughs> you're not gonna be able to look through there unless you're on a tripod. But right. with a pair of binoculars, seven power is the power that you're that a human body can take without having an unwanted tremoring. Yeah. So, and, and like Dan said, every time your heart beats, your hands move a little bit. You don't realize it, but they do. And so in astronomy world, 10 by 50 is sort of the starting size. And a trick I've learned is, and I can show you here with this cap on, you put it on top of the speakers, it works to say the same thing. One thing I do, whether I'm looking at birds or looking at um, uh, use them for astronomy, I will take the binoculars like this and then grab onto the bill of my cap and hold the binoculars like that. And it, it's a snap back or fitted cap. Locking the binoculars to the cap also locks it to your head. And so you can steady your hands even more by using that little trick, whether for birding or sports or astronomy as well. That's a great, um, that's a great suggestion, Kent. Thank you. That's great. You know, every, every little bit of reducing vibration and shake makes what you're looking at look better. And uh, you're always on that quest for that. So uh, if, if one of the, our watchers or, or our, our fans right now were to say, I've got an eight by 42. And then some guy comes to you and says, well, look, I got a 10 by 50. Okay, he thinks he's got he thinks he's got the best one for him because it's got a greater power. But guess what? Well, if he if he wants to look at a bird on a limb, he can't hold it still enough without a tripod. Yeah. Or they come up with a twenty by eighties or twenty by one hundreds. Boy, That's look at these. Number. That's yeah, you can't. And those things are so big and so heavy. Yes, you can hand hold them for a few seconds, but it becomes serious work really quick, and you just can't hold them still. All right, so. There's two distinct types of binoculars out there. And these are both MagnaView 8x42s. Um, roof prism, which is the one on the left. This pair happens to be fully multi-coated. And there's all sorts of different, you know, fully coated, fully multi-coated, on and on. Quick primer on that. Fully coated means the front elements and back elements are coated. Fully multi-coated means the surfaces are all coated um, inside and out. The one on the left, because of how they're made, they're water resistant. So you can get them dewy and damp and foggy and, and they'll be okay. The, the ones on the right, <clears throat> which are poroprism, so they have this, this standard traditional zigzag in the barrel of the binoculars are uh, called Poro Prism. And this model are not water resistant. Uh, interestingly enough, the close focus on the, this pair of Poro Prism is 12 feet, whereas the close focus on the uh, uh, one on the left is 19.6 feet. And that, that close focus distance sometimes does come into play in the birder world, doesn't it, Dan? Absolutely. Why? Well, because uh, you might be in a place where you're trying to be pretty quiet and all of a sudden a bird uh, comes towards you and lands eight feet away. Most binoculars would require you to make noise by stepping back about one or two yards so that you can get, you can get it into focus. But with the binoculars that's designed, I know that you have some binoculars that actually are inside at 10 feet. Mm -hmm. Those would be preferable for the birding for the birding world, but for the astronomy world, nobody cares about the close focus. Correct. But for the birders, there's even some binoculars that have five or six feet. Yeah, very special because of that specialized use. Correct. You know, and you you think, well, why would I want to look at a bird that was six feet from me? Because you really want to look at those details. Right on. Right. You know, a bird six feet away that's magnified seven times. 
is 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 you're going to get really good detail in what you're looking at and can really bear down. Whereas a bird that's 35 yards away still is a very small little bird, hard to pick out. Does is that eye ring all the way around or is it partial on top and on bottom? And it's in the shade. What color is that rump really, or the wing bar really? So, um, but you know, I've I've showed eight by forty twos here. There is a more um, common, mm -hmm. you know, the really preferred size is an eight by thirty five, right, Dan, or a seven by thirty five. You're yeah, we can't get lost in the numbers necessarily, but Kent is correct. Um, you can still hold an eight power without hand tremor, but that's why the, the human body can handle seven power. So, you know, the common, I think the most popular specifications for a binocular generally is seven by 35 with the five millimeter um, uh, exit pupil. This one here is just, just give you a little more power to, to eight power and you still have a little a little less than five uh, five millimeters of, of exit pupil. Yeah, four point three. I just did the math real quick. Four point three. You're so, quick, dude, man. That's, but look at the close focus on that. Yeah, six point five feet. Bird exactly what you're home. Which one. which is this pair of binoculars right here? I've got, and you know they're fully 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 multi coated. They're face coated, waterproof. They're this open bridge design, which makes them really easy to hold. Uh, they're really light, uh, just a beautiful pair of binoculars. Uh, so the, the point is, you know, just like if you're building a house, there's specialized hammers. You can roof a house with a framing hammer and you can frame with a roofing hammer, but using the proper tool makes life a whole lot easier for you. And so if you're going to be out birding, you know, seven by 35, Six and a half by 35, eight by 35 is that, you know, really primo sweet spot. And especially if you can get close focus down in that six, seven, eight foot range. So what, Dan, what's your favorite pair? Seven by 35? No, my favorite pair is eight by 42. Eight by 42? Eight by Why? Why? Uh, mainly because... Um, it has at least five millimeters of exit pupil. And uh, also it's not so heavy that you can't hold it. Cause you get a 10, if you get a 10 power magnification, uh, no, not magnification, but a, but a 50 millimeter objective lens, they, that gets to be pretty heavy over the course of uh, using it in the field. But 42 millimeters just has turned out to be the most common uh, contrast from a seven to a 10. Eight, eight power seems to be it. Okay. So next week, we're going to talk about spotting scopes, um, which are basically small telescopes with a specific design in mind. Um, they're so typically so big that you have to use a, a tripod for them. But most assuredly, there's a place for these in the birding world, right, Dan? Absolutely. Okay, we'll, Absolutely. We'll, we'll talk more about that next week. So uh, birds next week are going to be reader submitted. I've got a few more. If anybody's listening and wants to send in bird pictures they have, I'm really looking for pictures from the coast. Let me quit sharing here. Oh, you, Scott, Scott quit sharing for me. I already did. It. I was like, where'd it go? It's not there. <laughs> so, um, you know, we're, we're uh, looking for birds from the coast, you know, not coastal birds, but looking for birds that aren't coming through the, the central flyway, which is where we are, just to try and broaden it to birds that other people are seeing that may not be in other places. Although the birds we're seeing are, may not be in California or, or the Northeast as well. So anyway, still looking for a Rita Smith. I want to see those. And don't, you know, look, if your pictures aren't up to the, to the caliber of, of Terry Stanfield or Sheldon Fararski, that's okay. They're your pictures and you took them and you're proud of them. We want to see them. So real simple, send them to Explore Alliance at explorescientific.com. Scott's going to put in the chat, Explore Alliance at explorescientific.com. 
and we will uh, uh, get them on the show. So I need to have those um, by Tuesday, basically. Um, I try to work a couple of weeks ahead. I've gotten out of that habit, trying to get back in that swing again um, of that. So um, that's the show this week. What what comments and who do we have shout outs for, Scott? Well, we have, um, uh, you know, our regular group of followers that are, of course, talking about astronomy, but also about birds, which is cool. Uh, uh, we... Um, Let's see. Let's get past the camera stuff here. <laughs> and Tarek saying, oh, birds, what a lovely, what lovely living creatures, really. Um, Harold Locke says he uses your hat method, Kent, uh, with his 15 by 70 binoculars. Astrobeard, Richard Grace says, um, I love my 8x42s and would like a pair of 8x56s one day. Just more light. Uh, um, Rick, Rick, Richard Grace uses his binoculars with a camera, with a cell phone camera, and has sent us in some pictures of some sparrows from his lemon tree in sunny Southern California. Richard so, Grace? Yeah, he's, I think Richard did, didn't he? Mm, no, he doesn't. No, that was Andrew Corkle. <laughs> that, was, that was Andrew Corkle that did that. I'm yeah, that sorry. could be. Yeah. That could be. Okay, yes. but, but Richard Grace time for you to step up and send us some bird pictures <laughs> come on man we'll call you bird beard there we go um beatrice hines says i love my binoculars 8 by 50 and 20 by 80s but the 20 but the 20 by 80 i have to use with a tripod that's right harold Locke says i want the alpen 8 by 42s that's what i use too i i like those i like those especially with ed glass you know um and we've got some pretty nice, affordable ones. The the HS uh, brand Hunter Specialties, which is using the word Hunter and birding are sort of divisive, but yeah, really opposite ends of the spectrum. Yeah. But the the HS binoculars uh, that we have on our website are great binoculars. In fact, those are the ones I have. And so uh, um, I'm looking to see the price on because I don't remember. is well no prices right now yeah no prices right they're now. great great deal right now so they're a great deal yeah they're yeah. a great deal yep yeah. because uh, at the end of the day the best pair of binoculars people ask what's the best telescope well what's the best binoculars the same answer the ones you have are the one of the best binoculars you have so go use them and then decide what you're going to go spend money on but don't get in this mindset of, oh, well, I don't have 10 by 42, so I can't go birding. Get out there and enjoy the binoculars you have, you know, whether they're, you know, six by 26s or whatever. Go out there and use them. They're, start doing it. And I want to give a little bit of a shout out to um, uh, Eagles. We're almost to mid-October, and this is the time when eagles start coming down to Arkansas uh, to winter, uh, you know, for the, to stay here over the winter. And so I just realized that we're only 43 miles away from one of the top eagle viewing areas in Arkansas. And uh, apparently Arkansas is considered like one of the uh, meccas of eagle watching uh, during late winter. So, so where, are you, where is, where are you talking about for the, this is called, you're probably aware of it. Um, Bend. Would it be Hall of Bend? No, it is called uh, the Eagle Watch Nature Trail. Well, yeah, that's over at Gentry. That's In exactly, Gentry. That, yeah. that's Terry Stanfield's creation. The Eagle Watch Nature area there oh, is because- We got to make a pilgrimage out there. Yeah, so. we should do a show live from there. We need to figure out how to do that and do a show live from there. It's uh, difficult to do. Yeah. We can do that. We this this fall when the Send eagles you out show here up with a camera adapter and a spotting scope and have you yep. get zeroed in on a nest or something. That would yeah. Be the, there's no nest on the lake. There is a nest fairly close that I'm aware of, uh, just down creek a little bit mm -hmm. uh, because you know they they don't when they come here in the winter they don't build nests, but there have been multiple pairs that decided that 
you know, uh, life down here might be easier than life back up north. And they've stayed here and become breeding pairs. Uh, so also, eagle eagles will re reuse their nests. Right over. That's how you get bigger and bigger and bigger every year. Right. Um, so uh, yeah, this 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 fall winter after the eagles come back, we'll go do a broadcast, or, or at least go record a segment out there in the morning at sunrise, um, and 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 give a little thanks for Terry and his efforts that really has made this show. And, and, and this is what I want to see when we get out there. I want to see, well, I want to see this. I want to see an eagle trying to take away a rabbit away from a fox. Well, <laughs> let me, hang on a second. Let me, let me share my screen and show you what we can see. Uh, Look at that. I know, it's amazing. There's a whole series of these uh, images. The guy's name is Kevin Ebi, E-B-I. And uh, he has a uh, book out called uh, Year of the Eagle, which is really cool. So this should have been the fox and the eagle. Incredible. <laughs> so, yeah, let me show you. This is, I don't think I've used this picture before. So this is a, a fresh one. There's a juvenile bald eagle pulling a fish out of out of Swipco Lake at the Eagle Watch Nature Area. Mm -hmm. So uh, anyway, I've got some pictures here of of a picture with dozens of bald eagles in one tree. I'm not seeing it here. I may put it in another folder, but uh, yeah, there's there's some beautiful views out there. So we're gonna go do that. And man, oh man, they are big birds, really big. Yeah. So very cool. All right. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, Kent. And thank you to the audience. And we will see you tomorrow uh, for another episode on Focus on Astrophotography. Also, uh, tomorrow I will be giving a lecture. I'm not sure if it'll be broadcast or not, but I'm giving a lecture to the Heart of America uh, Star Party, uh, which is just up in Missouri. So, um, uh, you know, until that time, we'll see you later and I'll give you updates on uh, what's going on with Heart of America. Take care. Bye, everybody. Send me your pictures. Alpen Wings 8x42 binoculars are designed with versatility in mind. The BAK4 fully multi coated optics combined with the lightweight and ergonomic open hinge body design make these waterproof binoculars the perfect tool for any situation or weather. Armored and purged, these binoculars are tough enough to last against any minor bumps and dings and will never suffer from internal fogging. With the long eye relief and twist up eye cups, the Alpen Wings 8x42 binoculars are the perfect tool for any adventure.